Yay, Advent. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Advent is upon us. Advent is this time of year where we are anticipating the coming of the Christ. And so uh, this year as we uh, celebrate Advent, we just, we're lighting Advent candles to kind of remember um, or anticipate the, the, the Christ coming. And, you know, I, let, 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 let's, let's light some candles. So first, a, a few weeks ago, we remembered hope. Right? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And you will call his name Emmanuel from Isaiah 7.14. And when we light this candle of hope, what we remember is that throughout the ages, we, we go back to Genesis and we see that sin entered the world through through, uh, through Adam and Eve uh, participating and taking the fruit that was forbidden. The devil was there messing things up. And from the beginning, there was this glimmer of hope. Right, that, that the, the head of the serpent would be crushed by the seed of the woman. And so all mankind had hope from the beginning. Now, earlier I showed you the statistics from the International Mission Board. 3,060 people groups are unreached, unengaged with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have no hope. And friends, I, you got to see the reason that we give generously to missions is because we want to share the hope that we have. With hope, hand in hand goes love. And, and as we progressed, we went from hope to love. And, and, and darkness sets the stage for hope. And so the world in darkness, and there's a political darkness, and all this darkness all around. And so in that darkness, we have hope of Christ. And then love is sort of what promises that hope would come to fruition. The, the love of God that is given to us in Christ Jesus Right, and so we, 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 we read the next passage in Jeremiah 33. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people, the good promise that the virgin would conceive birth that I made to the people of Israel and to Judah. And so what God says is, Israel, I set my love on you and I'm going to save you. And I'm going to fulfill that promise. And friends, to us today, the promise is the same, that God has a promise to love us. When we looked at the candle of love and we talked about God's love, you know what's amazing is that God loves us because of God, not because of us. Which very simply what it means is that it's not, not on me to make sure that I'm good enough to guarantee the love of God. In fact, we did this last time, God loves what you're looking at, right? Just because of who God is, not because of who I am. Say that with me. Look at the person next to you and just tell them, say, God loves what you're looking at. And that little giggle that you get, that's joy, yeah. right? You know, every time, it doesn't matter how many times you say that, but you go home tonight and you tell your wife, you know, get, God loves what you're looking at. <laughs> and it's true because God's love is not dependent on you or what a good wife or good husband you've been. Do you understand, friend, God loves you because of who God is, and that's, that's why we have joy, and the angel appeared before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. It will be cause for great joy for all the people. And you imagine the setting of the shepherds, and they get the joy, and they're like, yes, God is going to save us. And they're excited, and they're like, you know, they're doing their happy dance kind of joy. And that joy, when it takes seat in our hearts, that, that's what leads to peace. And the angel uh, with them, with the multitude, the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. God gives us this deep-seated peace in our lives. And that's, that's this fourth candle that we light, the peace of God. I want you to see as we light the candles that hope and love go together just as joy and peace go together. Our peace is sort of a product of that original love or that original joy that we have in our lives as it takes root in us. And so today we focus on the peace of God. Would you, would you join your hearts with mine as we pray to God and just thank him for what he's done? Father God, we, we thank you for peace God, we thank you that you've given us peace, not like the world gives peace, but peace that originates from God, that is delivered through the cross. God, that is given to us eternally because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that today we would see your recipe for, for peace in your word. 
God, I pray that you would let each of us go through the rest of this Christmas season with an unstoppable peace that only you give. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, peace. Everybody, everybody wants peace at this time of year. As we go to the time of Christmas, everybody, everybody wants peace. But what's crazy is this is the time of year where we want peace so much, but the devil is working so hard to destroy your peace. The, uh, the world around us, the chaos, the, the, the strife, the, the hurt, the pain, all of this stuff that comes with the Christmas season, the busyness, the, the attacks, the, the little things in your life. You know, if you're married and you, you have kids or even if you're married without kids, wherever you are, something is going to happen in the Christmas season that's going to make you just lose your peace, right? Today... Today I want you to see that God has this recipe for peace, that Jesus offers peace. As we look at the text, there's two verses I want you to see. The first one, Luke 2, 13 and 14, that suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, and so the context, right, this is following on the joy. So the angel appears to the, the, the shepherds and says, don't be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause for great joy for all the people. The shepherds are like, all right, let's give it to me. And then suddenly there's this heavenly host praising God and they're saying or maybe singing, they're glorifying God, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And what we see is that God is saying, look, not only did I send Jesus that you would have joy in your hearts, but Jesus is coming that you might have this unstoppable peace. And what I want you to get between Luke 2 and John 14, what we see is the gap that bridges from the cradle to the cross. And the introduction to the cradle, the angel is saying, hey, God is giving you peace in this baby that is born in Bethlehem. And Jesus then in John 14, 27, he goes to his disciples and he says, peace I leave with you. Right, as I'm going to the cross, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. You see what Jesus is doing is he's looking at the disciples and he says, hey, and if you read that passage, John 14, and you just, just look at it, it, the whole chapter, what you'll see, John 14, 15, 16, 17, the high priestly prayer, Jesus prays for his disciples before the cross. And what he's saying to the disciples is, take heart. I'm going to die on the cross in just a little while, but I'm going to send the Spirit. So let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. I am coming and I'm going to take care of you. The Spirit is going to lead you and guide you. In fact, if you go back to verse 25, you get these things. Uh, Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you. Verse 26, introducing 27, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Following on, remembering what God has said or Jesus has said to the disciples, he says, peace I leave with you. In other words, from the cradle to the cross, what God wants for you in your life Friend, is peace. God wants you to have that deep-seated joy in your life that, that exists through the darkest times. That joy in your life that uh, makes you declare or cry out that to God be the glory when you're being persecuted for Jesus Christ. That kind of peace that no matter what is going on in your family or your finances or your work or your play, nothing is going to distract you from the peace of God that you have in Jesus Christ. This is today in Advent. What I want you to understand as we look at this in John 14, what we find is that Jesus gives us peace. Jesus gives us peace. The Spirit, in verse 25, leads us to peace. Then, third, we obey and experience peace. And this is, this is so important that we get this. These first two, that Jesus gives us peace and the Spirit leads us to peace. There's no contingency. There's no condition on the promise. Christian, Jesus gives you peace. Now, I would say that if you're not a Christian, then you don't have that peace of God. You can't, you can't take hold of that until you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior. But Jesus gives you that peace. Jesus gives you that peace just like the love of God, not based on any condition of myself or on any condition of you, but because God is God and God loves you. 
Because God loves you and God wants to give you peace, he gives the Spirit to lead us into peace. Remember what Jesus said in John 14 is that the Spirit will call to your remembrance. Right? All of the things that Jesus had said. Why? That you might have peace in your life. There's no condition on that. If you're saved, the Spirit dwells in you and the Spirit will remind you of things that God has said in God's Word. And we obey and we experience peace. This, this third point is where the contingency exists in, in our lives. When we fail to obey what God has told us, we fail to experience the peace that God has promised us. Listen, I, I want to be clear that when I, when I say that we fail to experience the peace, it's not that we lose our salvation. It's not that God loves us less, but what happens is God says, this is my plan for your life, my plan of peace and my plan of love and my plan of joy and my, my plan of hope. And, and it's this line right here. And, and, and we say, God, I, I got that, but I'm just going to do my own thing. And then we spend the rest of our life struggling saying, why, why don't I have peace? When we fail to obey, we fail to experience the peace that God has promised us, that the Spirit leads us to. And so today, uh, today in Philippians chapter 4, what we're going to do is we're going to look at God's uh, five-part recipe for peace. God's recipe for peace. And we're going to read the text kind of as we go through it. What I want you to see is uh, the famous verse, right? Paul famously proclaims Philippians 4, 7. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And we see that, and what I want you to get is that this passage, Philippians 4, it's one of those passages that if you go back, the Spirit leads us to remember. Because in John 14, Jesus says, the Spirit is going to be sent by God. Why? To call to your remembrance all of the things that I have said to you, that you might take hold of that peace. And so the things that God has said to us to take hold of that peace in Philippians 4 is just an extraordinarily well laid out plan for peace. The five parts, we'll look at each one of them individually, but I want you to see this. First, you work together. You ever experience peace in your marriage while you're arguing? <laughs> no, right? I mean, like, it's obvious almost, but God still states that. Second, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Exude gentleness. I like the word exude. <laughs> it's like oozing out gentleness. Pray confidently. We're going to look and we're going to see that our confidence in God is directly related to both our joy and to our peace. And then we direct the thoughts that are in our mind. We direct our thought life. Because if we're thinking on divisive things, if we're thinking on evil things, if we're thinking on bad things, we can't experience that joy that God has given to us when we obey him and his word. So first, right, work together. Work together in verses 2 and 3. Here's the, the context of Philippians is there's this argument and, and, and there's this argument really between these two people. If you were in Philippians, what you see is uh, Paul says, I entreat uh, Judea and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. And so what he's doing right away, and I, I put the first like four words of that there, he's saying, ladies, agree in the Lord. Agree in the Lord. It's, it, Maintain harmony in your relationship, unity in what you're doing here. Understand these these ladies, they're not, they're not false teachers. And I think this is so important because when Paul writes in Philippians 4, what he's, what he's doing is he's saying there's these two women that, that they're, they're butting heads. But these two women that are butting heads, they're not false prophets. They're not lost people. They're Christians. In fact, Paul says these ladies, these women, have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers. You see what God is saying or Paul uh, through the Holy Spirit Paul said, look, there are sisters in Christ and they, they, they're, they're arguing. Just like it, earlier in your marriage, husband, wife, you can't have a peaceful household when you're, you're butting heads. Let me, let me be clear that you're going to have disagreements in your marriage and your family. It doesn't make you less married, right? You're still 100% married even if you're upset or disagreeing or, or whatever. But you're not going to have a peaceful home in, in our lives, if we have this disagreement with people in our churches or in our, our, our Christian family, it's the same thing, right? If we argue and we butt heads and we fight in the Christian family, it doesn't make anybody less saved. It just makes us not at peace. 
And if we're not at peace, it allows the devil to get a foothold in and, and, and steal the joy that we have. I, um, I've been Christian long enough to see silly fights amongst Christians cause terrible disruptions. I could tell you that I, I've seen, you know, um, churches split over the color of carpet. And I laugh about it because it's the most ridiculous thing and I laugh so I keep from crying. But it's real. I, th I know a church that split because of the sizes of the eaves on the building. Right? I mean, get it. Both cases, the church, they're growing and they're growing and they're like, we need a new building and they're building and they're building and God is working amazingly and then there's two Christians getting a fight because one says we need 12 inch eaves, the other one says 18. I'm not going to worship without, you know, 18 inch eaves. It's going to totally mess up my mojo. For reals, this is what happens and this is why we need to work together. Agree in the Lord and then and then I want you to see what happens is that Paul goes on and he says, um, agree in the Lord. He also tells another person to help them. As he goes on, he says, yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women. As much as we should look to our friend and say, God loves what you're looking at, we should look at the person next to us and say this. Here, do it. Do it for me. This will be good. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm there for you. Say it like you mean it, because <laughs> God loves what you're looking at. I'm there for you. <laughs> With the excitement that we think God loves what he's, you're looking at, right? The same excitement and power should be behind, I am there for you. And whenever your whole world is falling apart and you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, I've got your back. You know, the reason that, that like, I, my, bullet, my number's on the back of your bulletin, my, my personal cell phone number, the reason that, that we put a, a deacon of the week in the bulletin is because if you need something, I, I'm there for you. It's not a fake off. For another Pastor Mike and the other deacons and Pastor Barry, we're there for you because we want to help you stand firm and maintain peace in your life. Don't do it alone. Don't be like the person who says, I'm going to figure this out all by myself. Because if you try to do that, the devil's going to pick you off. In, in fact, the reason that we need to be there for one another is because the devil wants you alone. And you can go to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 and you, you, you get this idea that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And, and, and what you see in your life and what you'll often notice is that when you're all by yourself trying to fix your problems alone without this group that God has given you, you're, you're going to fail. And you're going to fail to obey and you'll fail to experience that peace that God has given you. And so in your life, the first ingredient in the recipe for peace is that we need to work together. Work together that we might experience the peace that God has given to us. Next, the, the next point that we have is that we rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. There's a, where's Barry? There's a song that says that, isn't there, Barry? Yeah, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, I, I want you to see that, that this, this passage here in verse 4, it's, the admonition is an imperative. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. It, it's not a, not a suggestion. In other words, as we look at the recipe of peace and we start to see, okay, so God is telling us, first of all, if we want to have peace during Christmas time, we should work together. Work together in your family. Work together with your, your work. Work together with your friends. Work together with your church. Don't go it alone because it's going to be tough. And the devil's going to try to pick you off when you're by yourself. Next, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Remember back to the, the, the third candle, that, that, that joy of your salvation, that nothing else mattered except for Christ and what he did in your heart. Remember that day when you were baptized and you came out, up, out of the water and you're like, praise God for what he did. Do your happy dance for Jesus Christ like King David. Stay firm in the joy that God has given to us. Um, your confidence in the Lord is directly related to your ability to rejoice. You see that life is going to throw all these curveballs at us. Life is going to be tough. And there's going to be things in your life that you don't understand. But when we have confidence in God, it helps us maintain that joy through all difficult circumstances. When I can stand there and I can say, my God is bigger than everything, 
I can continue to rejoice even though everything seems to be falling apart day by day. Amen. Still, this doesn't entirely keep our joy from being stolen. We looked last time, we saw different uh, things that would steal our joy, different joy thieves that would come out. Things like sin. Remember uh, King David who danced before the Lord, this same king when he fell into sin, his joy was taken away. In our lives, the same thing is true, friend, when you, you have the joy of God in your life and you remember that, that joy of your salvation and you're like, yes, God, praise you for all you've given me. And then we fall into sin. It, it, it zaps that joy. It, it just takes it out of our lives and out of our hearts. And other things, people can take our joy away. Instead of working together, somebody can be that, that uh, thorn in your side. Right? You guys ever have one of those? like a messenger of Satan sent to buffet you like Paul had? You ever have that situation that's outside of your control that steals your joy? The guy that cuts you off in traffic and you're like, where did you get your driver's license? And you see that Nevada tag? You know where they got their license. <laughs> Same place you got yours. And it steals your joy away. And so we look, and I, I want to remind you just quickly about ways to recapture that joy. First, if the reason you've lost your joy is because of personal sin, do what David did in Psalm 51. Pray, confess, repent. Pray, confess, repent. Pray, confess, repent. Repeat. Pray, confess, repent, and do it again. And pray, confess, repent, and do it again. And the reason I keep saying do it again is because if you're like me, you have to keep doing it. <laughs> Not because you didn't get forgiveness from that one sin, but because you did another one. <laughs> and you did another one. And as much as you try not to, just like Romans chapter 7, where Paul writes, where I find myself doing the things I don't want to do, and the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And it's taking away my joy. And so what do I do? I pray to God, confess my sins, repent, turn away from that, and work on the next one. And then those sins that come from the outside... That, that, that threaten to take away our joy, we, we focus on things that bring us joy. We'll get to this because uh, Paul says to direct our thoughts. We share our joy with other people. We express the joy through worship of God. Again, let me, I can't tell you, Christian, how important it is that you make church a priority. That you make worship with other believers a priority. Why? Because working together ensures peace. Worship together ensures joy. There's no experience like praising God in a big group of believers like Jesus is Lord all together. And man, it, it, it does something to you with your joy. And then live by faith. Again, we do what God says to do. Just at the beginning when I told you that, that Jesus gives you peace, the Spirit leads you to peace, we obey and experience peace, we live by faith that we might experience the peace that God has for us in our lives because... When we go and we say, this is, the Lord, this is the line that God has strung out for us. This is the path that God has directed us in God's word. And we say, you know what, God, I know that this is the path that you've told me to follow, but I'm going to do it my own way. Nothing will take your joy and your peace away faster. Third, the third thing that, that, uh, that Paul tells us about peace is that we should exude gentleness exude gentleness. And I really like the word exude. I'm proud of that word today. I'm proud of exuding because uh, th this is the idea. We, if you don't like exude, you can write in your notes, emanate. If that one makes you uncomfortable too, write ooze. <laughs> we should be oozing joy or oozing gentleness in our lives. You see what... Uh, what, what Paul is getting at is that the, the gentleness, and by the way, the word gentleness is, um, it, it, in your translation, it'll, it'll be translated variously. Because in verse 5, the, the reasonableness, let your reasonableness be known to everybody. That word reasonableness, gentleness, uh, a gentle spirit, moderation, kindness, it's difficult to translate. But the big idea that Paul is getting at is this, this thing that you're supposed to exude or ooze, this gentleness, is the opposite of special, or selfish ambition. Think in your life what makes me happy for me and for nobody else. That selfish ambition that we all push away, that, that gentleness is the opposite of, of that thing. 
right? In other words, let me, let me maybe try to, to illustrate this for you in shopping, right? I, I shop like I drive. I even make the sounds when I slide around the corners. And, and somebody else is, they're racing to that checkout thing with you. Selfish ambition tells me to kick it in high gear, put on the boosters and get in front of them, <laughs> right? Gentleness says to put on the brakes and let them go first. Do you understand that? That kind of gentleness we should exude. And, and when Paul talks about it, the, the exuding is like it should ooze out of us. And the reason I like the word exude or ooze is because the, the graciousness in my life or in yours, it shouldn't be like little spurts, like a little bit of graciousness here, a little bit of kindness there, a couple seconds of gentle spirit here. But it's just this thing that should ooze out of our lives all of the time. We should be filled with this gentleness for somebody else. How does this make peace in our lives? Think back to the context where the context of Philippians 4 and the context of our lives really is these situations, uh, uh, headbutting or differences in our lives or difficulty that, that try to uh, steal our peace. Well, when we have gentleness with somebody else, what does that do to conflict? Husband, next time you get in an argument with your wife, apologize first. See what that gentleness does. Right? Say, honey, let's, let's, let's pray together instead of fight together. Right? Let's, let, let, let's you know, maybe um, go watch a show. Let's, let's do something that's going to be good for one another. Let's be gentle with one another. Instead of saying, my way or the highway, let's work together to get this done. We exude this gentleness. And, and, and what does it do? It gives us this peace in our lives. Uh, there was uh, one pop psychologist that was on TV and he used to say, you can be happy or you can be right. <laughs> and it's so true, right? But even more so, you can get your way or you can have peace in your home. You can get your way or you can have peace in your church. You can get your way or you can have peace at your work in all aspects of life. And, and, and just to be clear, I'm not talking about accepting sin or letting people do things that are wrong or bad or evil or detrimental. I'm talking about silly things like the color of carpet or the eaves on church buildings or not wearing bow ties, though you all should. <laughs> Exude gentleness. The next thing I want, want you to see, number four, pray confidently. Pray confidently. And I want you to see that, that, that our confidence in the Lord directly relates to, to the peace that we have. Do you understand that the guy that is standing there, and, and he looks a little bit arrogant, but it, it's still a good picture, behind him are these muscles. And that, that's, that's God behind us. And when we, we pray confidently, it's, it's not me, right? It, it's not, not my power that guarantees that God is going to do something. It's God's power that guarantees everything is going to work out as God has said that it would be. And, and, and Paul writes it like this, beginning in the, the second half of verse 5. He says, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. First, he says, the Lord is at hand. And what he's saying, maybe, maybe he's talking the Lord is at hand temporally, like the Lord is going to come back soon. But I think more appropriate is he's saying the Lord is close by. Christian, the, 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 the Spirit of God dwells inside of you. Christian, you carry around a little bit of Holy Ghost everywhere you go. And so when you pray to God, it's not like, I hope God hears my, my prayer. It's like Peter says, that we boldly approach the throne of grace. Listen, not arrogantly, but by the blood of Christ, we can come boldly before our heavenly Father because Jesus Christ died to give us that access. And so we pray to God confidently, knowing that he is going to give us that peace that he promised. Right? When Jesus says, I give you peace, and we go to God and say, God, I, you know, maybe you could give me a little bit of peace. We can pray and we can say, God, I know that you have promised me peace. Direct me, lead me, guide me to what I need to do to obey, to capture that peace, to acquire that peace. Listen, nothing is too big for God. 
When we understand who our Lord is, it gives us confidence because we start to see, right, our God is sovereign. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's all-loving. He's all-compassionate. That our God is bigger than the boogeyman. Our God created everything, and so he's bigger than anything that you might have messing up your life today. I... Listen, I, I don't know every problem you have in your life, but I'm sure looking around the room that every one of you has something going on. And what I can promise you is that God is bigger than that. Just think of whatever problem you have and you can tell yourself, God is bigger than my whatever, work problem, my relationship problem, my kid problem. God is bigger than whatever we have there. Now, I like the way that Paul continues. He says, in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And this is this, is this antidote for anxiousness. Be anxious about nothing in verse 6, but in everything. Be anxious about nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Friends, prayer is the antidote to anxiety or anxiousness or problems. Anxiousness, by the way, is the opposite of peace. You hear me in our lives, we, we get peace from Jesus Christ when we're saved. And, and then what happens? We start to worry. I've, I've talked to people who worry about their salvation. Pastor, I'm not sure if I'm really saved. It's causing me this, this anxious feeling. Listen, prayer is the, the antidote for that, that anxiousness. Let me show you in God's word, you know, that, that you can be sure of your salvation. Why? So you can go boldly before the throne of grace and with prayer and, and supplication, with prayer and specific prayer, make your request be made known to God so that you can experience that peace that transcends all understanding, that that peace would guard your hearts and your minds. It, the, the, the way it works is that we pray when we pray to this heavenly Father that is all-powerful and all-knowing and all-caring and all-loving. Understand, friend, when you pray, it's not that you have to say the right combination of words to get the right results. It's that you're making your request known to this God that loved you in spite of you so much that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for you so that the blood of Christ would allow you access to this perfect heavenly father that you could say, Father God, I need you. And you know why your father God answers? Because he loves you. And he answers like a good father. And so you can pray confidently and, and let that peace of God come over you that guards your hearts and minds. And then, fifth, Paul says we direct our thought lives. Direct our thought lives. And in verse 8, uh, Paul makes us a list here. And I like lists. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true... Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. You know, uh, peace comes as a result of what's going on inside of our lives. Our lives, in fact, are the product of our thoughts. What's going on outside is starting inside of us. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, when he talks about sins of adultery and sins of murder, the reason he goes back to the heart is because as a person thinks, that he is. When Jesus says, hey, you know, maybe you've never had a, an affair on your wife, but if you've lusted after another woman in your heart, it's like the sin of adultery. He says, maybe you've never, you know, taken a knife and, and killed somebody. But if you've hated somebody in your heart, it's like the sin of murder. Why? Because our thoughts are what transform our outsides. Proverbs uh, 23, 7 says it plainly, for as he thinks within himself, so is he. What our mind focuses on dictates how we live in our lives. Um, husband, if, if you're focused on pornography, you're going to have a hard time loving your wife. You get that? If you're focused on all those fake women that you see, or, or, or women, if you're focused on the fake men that you see, you're going to have a hard time loving your spouse. If, if, if we're, we're focused on, on sinful things, we're going to have a difficult time living a godly life. 
If we're focused on, I could do better than that guy, what that guy's doing, we're going to have a hard time enjoying what that guy's doing or what that girl's doing. If we're focused on, I can't believe pastor didn't shake my hand this morning, <laughs> you're going to have a hard time hearing the message that God has for you. Right? You know, and I laugh about the ridiculousness of this, but it's really not that ridiculous. I can't believe they sat in my chair. <laughs> Do they not know that that's my chair? And all through the whole service, we're singing, How Great Thou Art, and they're, How can they lose my chair? <laughs> and you, you walk out of church. Pfft, that was a bad time. Why? Not because there was anything wrong with church. But because when our thoughts are wrong, it messes with what's going on outside. You go home to your wife and you've been thinking about evil things all day and, and, and you have a hard time loving your wife and you're like, why is my marriage in shambles? Let me tell you, maybe it's not your wife's fault. Maybe, maybe it's that thought life needs to change first. So what do we do? In, in our life, when we start to think about something evil, redirect your thoughts. Redirect your thoughts and, 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 and listen, when... When you start to think about, like, you know, something evil, redirect your, if it's a marriage issue, when you start to think about bad times in your marriage, redirect yourself to think about good times in your marriage. When it's, when it's in your family, when you start to, to focus on all of the mischievousness things that your kids have done, think about the joy that you had when you first held them and they couldn't talk or walk or break things. <laughs> and how much you love them. You know, redirect your thoughts on the good stuff. When you start to think about there's 3,060 people groups that are completely unreached of the gospel. Use that to motivate yourself to do great things for God and to give generously toward missions. But don't get bitter about it. Use the fact that there's like 41,000 churches that International Mission Port is directed or related to that gives you joy. Direct your thoughts to the good stuff that's going on. And so... Again, let me remind you that all of these ingredients for peace, they, they culminate with, with where we started, right? That Jesus gives us peace. Jesus promised in, 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 in John 14, 7, that, 14, 27, that, that, that my peace I give you. Not as the world gives you, but I, I give you this peace that is unending peace. Jesus gives peace. The Spirit leads us to peace. Christian, that little voice you hear, it's, it's not like echoes of the pastor. It's the Spirit speaking to you. That little voice you hear that says, hey, don't do that. Do this instead. That's the Spirit leading you into to the things that Jesus had taught you in his word. And so what do we do? We obey and we experience the peace of God. We take hold of that which God has already promised to us. We live by faith. Now, I, I got two things here that, two big issues that keep us from peace this season. I, I've given you these five ingredients to uh, God's recipe for peace from Philippians 4, but, but listen, two things might be keeping you from peace this Christmas Eve, and one is, is no salvation. Friend, if you're out there this morning and I say, hey, Jesus gave you peace, and you're like, I've never experienced that. Maybe you've never experienced it because you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Every time the storm blows or the wind changes, it hurts and it distracts you and it messes with you. Maybe it's because you've never really felt the peace of Jesus Christ. The peace that comes when we say Jesus came, born of a virgin, grew up, lived a sinless life, died on that old rugged cross, his blood flowed down to cover you and I from the sins that we had in our life. He was raised on the third day. He's coming back to judge both living and dead. And when we stand before God, we will own up to our sins. And at that point, we will either be judged based on Jesus' righteousness or our own. And if we're, if we're, we're weighed based on our own righteousness, we will fail Friend, this morning, if you've never experienced the peace of God, when we have our time response, let me show you in God's word how you can take hold of that peace, that salvation that Jesus came to offer. Christian, maybe you've not experienced peace this season because you failed to obey God. 
you've lived a disobedient life and you know it. I'm not talking about the mistakes that we make. I'm not talking about the times where it's like, oh, I, I sinned, God, forgive me, help me get through this. What I'm talking about is the kind of ongoing perpetual sin that you know you need to get out of and you need help. Listen, we're here today to help you. When we have our time of response, it's not just a time for, for, for lost people to come and say, hey, I want to follow Jesus, but it's a time for saved people to come and say, pray for me. It's a time for you, Christian, to get right with God, to say, God, forgive me for this sin and you know what it is. Specifically, name the sin. Ask God to forgive you and repent and change and leave here with peace in your life. This morning, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask that you would stand with me as we pray that we could respond easier. And as the music plays, you seek God. Father God, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the salvation that we share in him. God, I, I pray this morning that if there are any here, God, who've never experienced the peace of God, that today they might, might realize their sinfulness, might believe and trust that Jesus died for them too, that they might profess him as Lord. God, I, I pray for my brothers and sisters here. Lord, that each one of us might confess our sins, might repent from them. God, that we might each have a shoulder to cry on if we need it. That we could continue Christmas season with your peace because we're living in obedience and experience that which you've already promised. We thank you, Father, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name.